Hello and welcome to another episode of Garden to Table with Rose and I am Rose. So today I'm in the kitchen again <laughs> and I am getting ready to start a batch of cheese. <laughs> yes, cheese. I started uh, cheese making not too long ago, sometime last year during the lockdown. I, I started a lot of things during lockdown that I hadn't done before. So cheese making is one of the things I've attempted and I'm still learning. Some came out great, some not so great. Many of them are still aging so I really don't know how those are coming out. But I uh, basically read a bunch of stuff on the internet. I bought a couple of books on cheese making, read those, and then went for it. So today I'm making feta cheese, and that is because I've run out. I uh, find that feta cheese in the grocery store is pretty expensive. I mean, one little eight ounce block is like six bucks or something, at least at my grocery store. Um, so that is uh, cross cost prohibitive, as they say, because usually, when I'm using feta, I'm using a lot of it because I am usually making spinach pie, which is one of my favorite dishes. I love spinach pie. I make gigantic casseroles of it and cut it up and freeze it. And usually that involves lots of feta cheese. Also, I like feta cheese uh, crumbled in eggs, like scrambled eggs. It's good in salads. It's just good. It's not for everyone. It's very pungent and salty, but I love it. So the cheese making book that I use most is called Mastering Basic Cheese Making, the, the fundamentals, let's see, the fun and fundamentals of making cheese at home. And it is by Giannaclis, I don't know if I pronounced that right, is the first name called Well. And that book, um, I have the digital version from Amazon. So that is a great book. It literally walks you through these lesson plans. And each lesson you uh, make a cheese that's more complex. So you start off making something really easy like yogurt um, or buttermilk. And then you progress to cream cheese and farmer's cheese and feta cheese. And then you get to mozzarella. And then after that is the more complicated things, the cheddars, the goudas, those kinds of things, parmesans, asiagos. So it's a good starter book to start you off. So there are some basic things that you will need to make any cheese. And the thing is with cheese making, it's very time consuming, very time consuming. It takes hours to even get your batch of cheese cooked up. And then it can take anywhere from um, a day or two to months to age it to where you want it to be. Now feta is kind of in the middle. Feta um, is brined in a salt water bath or a whey, in a whey bath if you have enough whey to submerge your feta in. So it's a little bit quicker. Um, it's done in a few days. You can age feta as long as it's covered in some kind of liquid. I usually leave mine in the salt brine. As long as it's submerged, it will stay good for you for probably months. So you can age it that way. You can also pack it in oil and that's a whole nother process, which I have not done and I probably will not do. Like I said, I usually use mine mostly for spinach pie. <laughs> so that's what I'll be doing. Now, as expensive as cheese is in general in the store, particularly feta we're talking about now, it's very inexpensive to make. Um, you really only need a gallon or two of milk. Now you can use whole milk, you could use low fat milk. I prefer whole milk because we're making cheese here. I mean, this isn't diet food, it's cheese. So I want it to be as rich as possible. So I use whole milk, but basically you don't want to get ultra pasteurized. You just want to get plain old milk. So just my plain old store brand milk I get for cheese making under two bucks a gallon. One gallon will make on average about a pound or so of cheese. So for 350, you know, a little under four bucks. I uh, got two gallons of milk, so I'll be able to make two to 
four pounds of cheese, depending. We'll see how much it comes out to be. Maybe I'll weigh it. I've never actually weighed it, but maybe I'll do that this time. So you're gonna need whole milk, basically. You're gonna need salt. You're going to need calcium chloride, which you can order from any cheese making supply store. Do not get these things off of Amazon. Um, it's one of the few things on Amazon where it's more expensive to buy it there. It's overpriced. So a lot of the things I got from New England Cheese Making Supply Company, they have everything. I will say that I have bought many, many things from them, cultures, uh, rennet and stuff like that. Even these tiny measuring spoons. I bought molds from them. So they have everything. The only problem I've ever had with this company is that 50% of the time my order is missing an item. And that bothers me because, uh, you know, they just should have tighter packaging control processes, it seems to me. Um, and I don't order a ton of stuff. It's not like I'm ordering 50 items. I'm just ordering like five things. And usually half the time there's something missing and then I have to contact customer service and they have to mail it back out to me. So that's kind of a pain. There are several cheese making supply stores online. I've tried uh, one other one and I can't think of the name, but they only sell cultures and actually they were a better price than this company. But basically search for cheese making supplies and the companies will come up. So you'll need calcium chloride. You'll need some kind of rennet. Rennet. Rennet is what coagulates your milk. So it's what's going to cause the molecules to clump together to form cheese. So it's very important. <laughs> there is vegetable rennet. There's animal rennet. Um, I use both. Obviously the animal rennet is to me it produces a better cheese that's just my own personal opinion but i do use both just to experiment i haven't noticed any real difference between the two any significant difference but i do believe animal rennet is better so today i'm going to use the vegetable rennet because i have so much of it in my animal rennet i am running low so, and right on these uh, labels from this particular company, they tell you how much to use. So it's pretty awesome. So for the vegetable rennet, it says use one fourth teaspoon. It sets two gallons of milk in 45 minutes. So and you don't use very much. So one fourth teaspoon. So it'll last you a while. And then the calcium chloride helps produce firmer curds. So you use, and this is optional, I believe, in most of the recipes, but I use it one fourth teaspoon for every gallon of milk. So you don't use a lot of this either. They have to be refrigerated. You're also going to need a culture. Now, depending on what cheese you're making, the type of cheese is going to determine the type of culture you need. There are, I don't know, 20 different cultures for cheese making. Then you get all your cultures for sausage making because I make sausage too. Um, there's just a lot of cultures for making a lot of things, cultures for wine making and, and, uh, you know, anything that needs to be fermented really. So feta, at least the recipe that I use, uses this flora danica. Let me see that. Flora danica. And this is by Hansen. This CHR Hansen produces a lot of the cultures. There aren't many companies that produce cultures, surprisingly. Um, it's, a, it's limited. There may be one or two that I found that produces and sells cultures in this country. This isn't even from the US. This company is Denmark. So the cultures can be a little pricey. I would not buy them from Amazon again because they're overpriced on Amazon. So, but you will need this Floridanica. You don't need much of the cultures either. It's one fourth teaspoon per gallon of milk. So that's not a lot. So this little bag will last you for a while. In addition to that, you'll need some measuring spoons. You'll also need mini measuring spoons because a lot of things are like one fourth of a teaspoon, one eighth of a teaspoon. So I found this miniature measuring set, let's see, which has a 3 16th teaspoon, one eighth, one sixteenth, one thirty second, and one sixty fourth. And so this I got on the uh, New England Cheese Making Supply Company's website, I believe. But this comes in handy because there are a lot of things that 
are these minute amounts that they want you to use and I don't know how else you would measure them other than that or by weight. You're also going to need some kind of thermometer that you can hook on your pot. I have this little digital one. It was cheap. I think I got it from my local grocery store. I like that it has big digital numbers. It's easier for me to see. But basically this is going to clip onto your pot and you know tell you the temperature of your milk as it's heating up. Now temperature is very important in cheese making because too high a temperature you'll ruin it, too low a temperature it won't it won't set right. So temperature is extremely important. I do have one of these temperature guns that you can use and you just push the button and it zaps the surface and tells you the temperature. To me that is too willy nilly. That's, <laughs> that's not precise enough. You want something pretty precise because there are small temperature ranges that they, that the culture that you're using likes to operate in. So I would invest in some kind of actual probe thermometer. The big digital screen is nice for people like me who you know, as I'm getting older, it's hard for me to see print without reading glasses. So you'll need that. You'll need some kind of big ladle, ladle, which has holes in it. <laughs> That's important. So invest in one. I mean, you can get one for 10 bucks, basically, off of Amazon or whatever. So you just want to invest in a big what, ladle, skimmer, whatever you want to call it with holes in it, because you're going to use this for stirring you're going to use this for and actually you don't usually stir the the cheese once you put the culture in there usually the stirring that you do is an up and down motion because you don't want to disturb it too much but you're going to use that for this for stirring you're going to use this for pouring in things like your rennets and your calcium chloride so you want to evenly distribute it so that a lot of times i have you pour it over the ladle Usually you will dilute these with water before you add them to your milk as well. And then you will need a cheese knife. So this one is just straight and it's long. You know, you want it to be long enough to get to the bottom of whatever pot you're using, right? So this one, I think I got this one from the New England cheese making company, supply company. It was inexpensive. I don't know, 10 bucks, 15 bucks, something like that. But you're gonna need this because this is what you'll use to cut your curds. That so it slides right through the, the cheese mixture like butter. So you'll need that. And then I also use just a regular big here, a silicone spatula. I use this just for stirring the milk as it's heating up to make sure it's evenly heated. You're going to need you're gonna need a double boiler and a big one. You want something that's going not too big where you can't manage it, but you want something that will hold at least two gallons of milk. That seems to work. Now I don't know how many quarts or gallons this one is. It's big though. And like I said, it's a I've already heated up the water in there. It's a double boiler. You'll need that because you don't want to scorch your milk. It's very easy to burn milk when you're heating it up. That helps you to regulate the temperature also because there are many steps where they want you to let it sit for so long. So that's, you know, so you gotta, when you let it sit, they want you to maintain the temperature. So it is helpful to have the double boiler. Mine's came with this lid as well. I think I got mine from webrestaurantstore.com. I think, I'm not quite sure, but I know I got it online. This was not cheap. This was an investment because it is a stainless steel double boil. And this will be your cheese making pot. That's all I really use this for is cheese making, period. I tend to use a giant Tupperware container. I have several giant Tupperware containers just I've collected over the years. So I really just use that. I was thinking another good thing to use would be some if you have a crock for sauerkraut and I happen to have one. I don't have a ceramic one um, or stone one, but I do have a plastic one. And so what, what that includes, one, it's a big vessel, but it also has a inner lid that applies pressure to whatever is under it. So that's good for keeping things submerged. So when you're making sauerkraut, which is a fermented thing, you want the cabbage completely submerged at all times or else you can get mold and nasty stuff. So you could use something like that for this as well. But I'm just going to use my Tupperware container and because I'm gonna pack the cheese, you know, to the top, it'll stay submerged once the lid is on. 
and that's the way I'm doing mine. And that's pretty much all you need. Refrigerator space, because this is a cheese that at some point you're going to have to put in the refrigerator to age, and you're going to store it in the refrigerator. So you need enough space for whatever container you choose to use. And that's all the ingredients. So, process in a nutshell, according to the recipe, time, two and a half hours of active work, <laughs> stirring, monitoring, all that good stuff, and 12 hours inactive. So, we're talking 14 and a half hours. So, this is usually cheese making is something that's going to be an overnight project, at least one overnight maybe more than that depending on what kind of cheese you're making so what i usually do is start these in the evening it's not evening now it's actually midday it's about 2 2 p.m but usually i will start these in the evening and then the rest period that you need to let it sit which is usually several hours for any given cheese i'll let i'll do that while i'm asleep like overnight and then continue it in the morning so cheese making is time consuming but it's it's cheap I mean compared to actually buying the cheeses um, and you can you know as you get better and better you can start to make special specialized cheeses you can add different flavorings herbs whatever to them um, so I've made several unique ones that actually are still aging I made a wine what was it it's a wine infused cheese I'm not sure if that was a cheddar or what. It's been some months because they've been aging for months. I made one that was an herb infused one. So it's kind of a green and white sage and what was it? Sage and parsley I think I used. I've made a like a chipotle smoky rub cheese. Um, so again, they're all aging. I haven't even tasted them yet, but they're probably about done now because it's been a few months. So. So your cheese cave, the cheese cave can be a cellar if you have one, some kind of storage space, but you need to be able to kind of regulate the temperature and the humidity. So, you know, I don't know that most people would have that in their house. What I have found is a shortcut around that is that I bought a mini fridge, one of the ones that's used for beverages. Um, so you want something with shelves. So, but you want about 45, I believe, for 42, 45 for your cheese fridge. So I have a mini beverage fridge that I put in my basement. That is my cheese fridge, and that's where I age all of my cheeses. I age my cheeses usually in food saver bags because that helps with the prevention of mold. Mold is a good thing if you're an artisanal cheese maker. There are good molds, there are bad molds. Um, I am not. I am a learner, so to try to make it as easy as possible for me, I food savor it. If you want to do it, I guess the uh, old school way, you would use cheesecloth or something like that and wrap it up. Some people use wax. They melt the uh, beeswax or something like that and make a co coat it all the way around. That's uh, an elaborate process that I have not tried any of those. And then I think with the mold, you gotta wipe it off every so often, or there's a whole lot of rules to it. And I don't wanna mess with mold because I'm not, I don't know that much about it. So I food saver mine and to suck as much air as possible out and to help it stay bacteria free for as long as possible. Now it's cheese. So you still may, as you're aging it, if you're aging something for a month, you probably still, even with the food saver, um, you're going to get some mold because it's in a 45 degree vessel. It's not super cold, cold enough to keep it from the bacteria from growing. So that's okay though with cheese. You cut that part off. I mean, literally, you cut that part off and it's good to go. So as long as it's just a surface mold. All right. So the first thing you want to do is heat your milk. You're going to heat your milk in your double broiler into boiler until it is 88 to 90 degrees. It says once you get it up to temperature, you need to hold these temperatures. So that didn't require some finagling on your part. You're going to have to figure out a setting on your stove or whatever 
where it's low enough that it won't let it get out of that range. Um, with this double boiler, the nice thing is that water that's in the bottom pot stays hot for a long time, so it holds the temperature. It doesn't take long for this to get up to, to 88 or 90 degrees. I mean, that's less than body temperature, right? So after you warm up the milk, warm up the milk to 88 to 90 degrees. After it reaches the correct temperature, then you're gonna sprinkle your culture, which we are using one fourth teaspoon per gallon of milk. And again, the directions for the cultures as well are is usually on the package. So that means I'm going to use one half teaspoon, so I have two gallons of milk. So you're gonna sprinkle that evenly across the top. You're gonna let it sit for three to five minutes to hydrate your culture, which is a living organism, right? So that's why temperature is really important. If it's too hot, you're gonna kill the bacteria in the culture. If it's too cold, you're not going to stimulate it enough. So it's pretty precise. So sprinkle that on, let it sit for five minutes, stir gently for two to five minutes. Now at this point, you can actually stir in a circle. Then you let it ripen. So to ripen, you basically maintain a temperature of 88 to 90 degrees and you let it sit for an hour. Um, I would cover it with your lid because that way you're gonna hold in the heat. So it'll be a little easier to maintain the temperature. After the one hour, if you're using the calcium chloride, and I always use it, um, then you're going to stir in this and dilute it first. So what I do is a fourth teaspoon for every gallon, so I'm going to use a half a teaspoon. I will dilute this in about a fourth a cup of water before I add it to my milk mixture. So what I usually do is I'll take that and take my ladle, pour it over there, and then they want you to stir. So you can actually stir that the normal way in a circle if you want. You could do up and down if you want as well. Um, the up and down really comes more into play once you've added your rennet because that's what starts it to coagulating. So you don't want to stir because you're going to be breaking up the curds, as, which is the opposite of what you want. You want it to curd together and form a mass, right? A solid mass. So that's when you want to do just an up and down for stirring like this. You don't actually go in a circle. You'll break up the curds up and down move the spoon up and down so you're not trying to disturb it too much but you want to mix it so after the calcium chloride you put that in stir it to dissolve let it sit for five minutes to do its thing and then you're going to add the rennet which is the <laughs> the uh, big big to do because once you add the rennet then you'll start to see it some cheeses will start curding up pretty quickly and so it's amazing to watch this transformation of a pot of milk so this also you're going to dilute I use a quarter cup of water but this is one fourth teaspoon for two gallons so not very much one fourth teaspoon you can use a tad more if you think you need it uh, this one is double strength they call it so I don't double strength I don't know what that means but that's what it says on the bottle so whatever bottle you use though remember it should have your directions how much you need per gallon of your milk on the bottle so just follow that more so than your recipe because th the recipe could be using a different rennet it could be using single strength or it could be using animal rennet so you know they're interchangeable for you you can use animal or vegetable if you're a vegetarian, obviously, I don't know, you want to use vegetable, but of course, if you're a vegetarian, would you be eating cheese? I don't know. It's from an animal, the milk. <laughs> so, that's a whole nother thing. All right. So the rennet, stir, you're going to stir the milk in an up and down motion with the ladle. Stop stirring briefly. Pour the diluted rennet over the top of your ladle. Oops. Hold the ladle to the top of the milk in several spots to steal the milk. And then you're going to let that coagulate. So that takes about 45 minutes according to this bottle and according to my recipe. So you're going to, again, you're still maintaining that temperature of 88 to 90 degrees for 45 minutes. And then you're going to cut the curd, which is the fun part. <laughs> so you're gonna cut your curd into three fourth inch to one inch cubes and then let it rest for 10 to 15 minutes. So 
after the 45 minutes, your stuff here should have set up a little bit. So it should be, you know, jiggly, but firmer. I mean, it's turning into cheese, right? So you're gonna, that's when you're gonna take your cheese knife, you're gonna cut straight down lines, three fourths inches apart, three fourths of an inch to one inch. Then you're gonna go per, the, the perpendicular way and do three fourths to one inch all the way across. So you're creating curds, you're cutting the curds. And then let that rest for five minutes. Then you're gonna drain it. That's where you get the whey off of it. You should save your whey if you can, because you oftentimes can use that then for brining uh, cheeses if you're making a cheese that needs to be a brine. So to, to uh, drain it, you're going to line some kind of colander with cheesecloth. If you're saving your way, you want a vessel obviously under that to catch it. And then you're gently laterally, ladling, ladling, ladling out your curds with your big spoon here into the colander. The key is you don't want to disrupt the curds too much. You don't want to break them up, right? So you're trying to be as gentle as possible. But you're ladling that out once you get kind of you know where you've gotten out most of the big pieces then you gently can pour all of the whatever's in the pot over the rest of that and let that drain out and so once you've drained it in the cheesecloth you're going to take your cheesecloth and tie it up i forgot to add that you're going to need colanders and cheesecloth and if you're doing a molded cheese you're needing cheese molds too but we're not doing a molded cheese we're doing one that we're just going to kind of slice up and go about our business <laughs> so you uh, are going to gather up that cheesecloth and tie it or whatever you want to do and then you're going to have to hang it now you could tie it to this ladle put it across your pot and hang it that way um, how do I usually hang mines I think I usually hang mines from my cabinets, uh, my kitchen cabinets actually, or I have a little rack that I have um, like my little ceramic dishes or whatever sitting on that's above my microwave and it has hooks. You know the racks with hooks on the bottom. Well, I use that to dry herbs, but I also use that to drain cheese. So you could tie your cheesecloth to your cabinet, put a bowl under it because it's draining to catch all the liquid. You could do it that way. Or for me, I'm gonna probably tie mines up to my rack and hang it, hang it from one of the hooks and put a big bowl on top of the microwave to catch all the way. So you're going to hang it and let it drain for 12 hours at room temperature. So that's the overnight part. So you can go to bed or do whatever. <laughs> 12 hours is a long time. You don't want your bundle to touch the liquid because you're trying to dry it, <laughs> you know, so you don't want it to get immersed in the liquid or you'll have a problem so make sure it's high enough where it won't touch the liquid and uh, that is pretty much the end of the big part and so with feta it's pretty simple because after you've drained it you're pretty much good to go you're gonna slice it up you're gonna put it in the salt water brine and let it age for a little bit and you're good to go so according to the recipe once it's drained 12 hours unwrap it cut it into one inch thick slabs sprinkle salt on both sides of the slabs put it in a tub or in a giant ziploc bag so this salt is going to pull out more moisture so you're firming it up even more it's going to pull out more whey and uh, you're going to let that sit in the salt for eight hours so a whole nother day <laughs> eight more hours and you know turn it occasionally if you need to or whatever the case may be but you're basically trying to pull water out of your cheese to make it more of a solid mass it's also allowing the cultures to do their thing you know to uh, transform this into the wonderful feta cheese that we know and so after that eight hours you can use your feta right away <laughs> You can use it right away, it's good to go. Now it does taste better if you age it, like most cheeses. So if you're gonna use it right away, you can just put it in the refrigerator and, or you know, if you're gonna use it in the next couple of days, store it in the refrigerator as it is. If you're going to age it or store it, you need to put it in a salt water brine. You can use the whey if you have enough whey collected. Um, when I was making a lot of cheeses consecutively, what I would do is I would just save these jugs and wash them out 
and then once my whey was cooled down from whatever cheese I made because most cheeses you don't you just pour the you throw the whey away <laughs> you throw the whey away <laughs> so most with most cheeses so then when it cooled down I would just strain it and put it in these jugs and I would store these jugs out in I have another fridge in my garage I store it out there for whenever I needed it and then I pull them out I don't have any stored whey right now so I'm going to use what I get from the cheese and then I'm going to add salt water to compensate for to have enough to cover it but basically if you're going to store it you want to submerge it in your brine and then you're going to let it sit out at room temperature for eight another eight hours and it's going to be it's still going to keep pulling more liquid from the cheese so you know it should be creating even more whey more of the brine and then um, after that eight hours you're going to take it and like I said make sure it's submerged however you're going to do it usually I put plastic wrap on top of the cheese the feta cheese that's in the brine and then put my Tupperware lid on top of that just make sure it's submerged because anything that's not under the salt water is probably going to mold and you don't want to see mold that just kind of ruins the effect so you can let it stay in there for weeks or months all you have to do is look at it occasionally make sure the the whey is still covering your cheese taste it occasionally you know take a little piece see with us while how you like it i have found that it gets better with age definitely so I've given you the overview of the method now I'm going to do my steps and so I will be back when uh, there's another step and let you know what's happening all right we'll be back We're going to strain it and hang it and that will be all for today because it has to hang for at least 12 hours so we'll do that and then I will come back tomorrow and show you what we do after we've drained it for 12 hours I won't show you the straining process basically you're gonna take this ladle you're gonna take a colander lines with cheesecloth put it in a bigger bowl or vessel ladle as many of the curds as you can in and then what's left pour over that save your way because you're going to use that to brine your cheese and then tie the edges of the cheesecloths together hang it somewhere where it can drain off the rest of the way for the rest of the night 12 hours all right so that is it for today i shall see you tomorrow for part two of the feta cheese making video all right bye bye And I'm purposely just showing uh, from the waist down because I'm doing this quickly. This is only going to take a few seconds and this is the easiest setup I got right now. So I hung my feta cheese from a hook over a big, big bowl and you want to reserve the whey because the whey is going to be used to age your cheese. You're going to use it to make a brine. Um, or to add to the brine so I've done that I hung it for probably it was over 24 hours it may have been closer to 30 hours just because at um, 12 hours I think the initial the initial amount was 12 hours it was still too wet in my opinion it wasn't holding together like I like feta cheese to be firm and hold together so I just let it hang a little bit longer than I got busy and so I'm just taking it 
down. I'm on my way to work, so it's early in the morning. I'm going to do this step, and then the idea is by the time I get home from work, it'll be ready for the final step. All right, so I wrapped mine in cheesecloth, and it has given me this brick of cheese. Did you see that? <laughs> now, mine came out shaped like a loaf just because I just tied the cheesecloth and hung it up. If you want different shapes, you would probably need to use a mold, a cheese mold, which you can order those online, but they're hard plastic molds usually, and they have holes in it, some, some array of holes for drainage. You could use that if you want a specific shape, but with a cheese mold, you have to have some way to apply pressure. Usually there's a follower that goes in the mold that sits on top of the cheese, and you need something on top of that to press down to press the liquid out. Um, when you hang it, gravity does the job for you. So I have cheese molds, but I didn't want to use one this time. I have a big container. Now this, I think I got from a kitchen supply store online. I have a bunch of these in different sizes. It's just the, you know, a commercial kitchen kind of clear container. I like it because I can see what's going on inside of it. And then I have the lid for that. The next step is you're going to cut your cheese into about one inch slices. And then you're going to generously salt each slice and then put them in the container, put the lid on, stir it at room temperature, store it at room temperature for about eight hours. I am using just this canning and pickling salt because it's just the first thing I grabbed. You could use sea salt, you can use any kind of salt you want for this, but this is what I'm going to use for this step. And I will speed this along most likely. my lid on so this is going to sit on your kitchen counter or wherever it needs to be somewhere room temperature um, somewhere where you know won't get in anybody's way eight hours so now I'm on my way to work when I come back in eight hours I mean also they recommend that you turn the pieces every so often if you can um, you could also use a big ziploc bag for this because it is going to start to make a brine and you know, they just kind of want you to bathe it in the brine. I'm not going to do that because I'm not going to mess with this and constantly move it. It's just going to break it up more, in my opinion. So I'm going to let it sit because it will soak in a brine that is pretty salty after this for either days or up to months. It will last as long as you have it submerged in the brine. So I'm not really worried about getting all this salt into it right now because it's going to be salty enough. So... That is it for this segment. I'm on my way to work. And then when I come back at the end of the day, we'll go to the final step of aging and storage. All right. I'm back and it is 10 hours later. My cheese, I will tell you, <laughs> it's broken up into smaller pieces now. And that's because I accidentally dropped the whole container. <laughs> Luckily the top didn't come off, but I dropped the whole container and so it just broke up a little bit more. But if, I don't know if you can see this, it has about half an inch of, of liquid brine that's been produced from letting it sit. You could use it like this, fresh, um, if you like to. I tasted my I tasted it. It's not salty enough for me. And I I was very conservative with the salt initially because I didn't want it to get too salty. But I want it saltier than than what I have now. I guess if you are on a low salt diet, a low sodium diet, you might want to leave it like this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cover this in whey, add salt to it. So I'm trying to make a salty brine to you know, reduce the possibility of mold or bacteria growing and also to, in, to, to infuse the cheese with salt. So that's what I'm going to do. And then I'm going to put it in the refrigerator and I am just going to leave it there. And as I need it, I will go out and get it and use it. So let's see. Now there is a ratio <laughs> that you can use that is in that book that I 
mentioned the basic cheese making book, but I'm not using the ratios. I'm just gonna do my thing. Now what I have here is the way that came out of the two gallons of milk when I was making the cheese to begin with. And there's a lot of it. I'm not gonna, oh, I'm making a mess. I'm not gonna use all of it. I just want enough so that my cheese is completely submerged because we don't want it to get any mold or anything. As long as it's completely submerged in this salty brine, we should be good to go. A bit more salt <laughs> to be on the safe side, just a little bit. Now they say if you're gonna age it, what they would like you to do is put plastic wrap on the surface of your of your liquid. Uh, there is just another, I think, safeguard to prevent bacteria from growing. So I took this plastic wrap and I'm just laying it on top of the liquid. And, ho and it also probably will help keep your cheese submerged in the liquid. Mine has no problem. It's not floating to the top or anything. It's easily submerged. I think it's because of the narrowness of the container I chose. And then you're gonna let this sit out for eight more hours. <laughs> I know it's a lot of, lot of multiple hours of sitting, but you want to let this sit out for eight hours before you refrigerate it. Then after that eight hours, taste it. See if it's like you like it. Put it in the refrigerator and you can leave it in there for months. This will last you for months as long as the cheese is submerged in the brine and take it out as you need it. Now this amount, I should have measured it. I should have measured the block. I did not do that, um, weighed it. I mean, on my little kitchen scale, I did not weigh the block before I cut it up. It would have been interesting to see how much. I would say from the size of it, it probably was two pounds. So probably two pounds of cheese from two gallons of milk. So, you know, each gallon of milk makes a pound. That's pretty good, you know? And the bottom line is, if you buy feta in the store, you're paying five, six, seven bucks for just a half a pound, eight ounce, a little square. Whereas you can make it yourself for milk is under $2 a gallon. And then if you are into cheese making, you'll have all of the cultures in your freezer because you know, each one makes multiple batches, each pack. So you'll have all that stuff already, really. And so the, 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 it's a minimal investment to make your own. Now I will add as a disclaimer, real feta, Greek feta is made not from cow's milk. I think it's made from sheep's milk, sheep's milk, I think. And I, I obviously I don't have that at my local grocery store and I'm not a farmer, so I don't have any sheep or any sheep's milk. Uh, goat milk or whatever else you might use to make cheese out of. So I use just cow's milk with everything. You could also use raw milk, which I heard uh, makes a more flavorful cheese if you can get your hands on it. Uh, generally here, unless you're a farmer who has cows or you know a farmer, uh, I think there are also some collectives or something like that here where you can buy shares because it's illegal to sell raw milk in Michigan. But if you buy these like shares in ownership of, of cows with different firms, then you can get so much raw milk per week. Like, I don't know, a couple of gallons a week or something. But that's the whole thing is, you know, you got to go pick it up at whatever the meeting spot is and you know, it's a, it's a lot to get raw milk. So I'm just going to use pasteurized cow's milk. And remember, do not use ultra pasteurized, just the plain old cheap stuff. <laughs> okay. And uh, that's it. So I'm going to end this video. I don't, you know, there's no point in coming back after the eight hours because it's still going to look the same. But this is one of the easier cheeses to make actually because you can eat it you know pretty much right away after you do these steps that i've showed you the others usually you have to 
pack away and age for months. You know, the cheddars, the goudas, that kind of thing. So, Parmesan's, <laughs> Asiago. So, this is a good place to, you know, one of the best ones to start with, I would say, because it's, it's something that will, you'll have your results pretty quickly. You know, you got to have patience for the other cheeses. All right. That is all for this episode. I hope it was uh, in a little bit informative, maybe a little bit entertaining, and maybe it will spark your interest in trying to make your own cheese. I mean, even if you want something quick and easy, you can start with yogurts, sour cream, buttermilk. Um, those are all fermented cultured products, so they're all in the same class, the same category. All right. So that is the end of this video and join me next Wednesday for another video for another garden to table with Rose video. <laughs> All right. Bye bye.